So uh, our next speakers are Katie Sheehan and Summer Hess, who are coming to us from the community building in Spokane, Washington. This is a five building campus that I honestly just learned about earlier this year, maybe, maybe earlier this year, maybe end of last year. So sometimes we're just, we are continuing to connect all of these folks who are working in shared space and working in really interesting ways. Um, and I'm really intrigued about your model that has five buildings, including a nonprofit center, an arts hub, and a food hub as well. So I'm <laughs> pleased to turn it over to Katie and Summer. Oh, and here you go. Take that one, I'll take that one. All right. Here we go. Um, so I'm Katie. Yeah. I'm Summer. <laughs> and how do you do this? <laughs> ah, okay. Oh, wrong button. I can't click upside down. Okay. We're going to be talking about biomimicry as a way to um, discuss our shared space innovation work. And we've been around since we bought our first building in like 2001. Um, and it was one of these accidental issues where the legal organization needed a space. And so they got to be friends with some other people and we bought a spot. So we, um, that's the wrong thing. Is it this? There we go. But to f we're gonna practice some biomimicry here right now. So, it's important to ground yourself in place, right? That's the whole point of this. Why are we here? And so we were gonna do this for Denver, but then we realized we don't know anything about Denver. So we're gonna look at Spokane and where it is, and where it is in relation to our Earth. And so here we have Spokane, and here we have Denver. So we're, we've got a big couple of ecosystems in between here. Um, I am so sorry, I cannot figure this out. Okay, here we go, we have Spokane. This is a, a more um, zoomed in view, and I don't know if you can tell this, but if you look at this, why is Spokane where it is? You can see right here, this is some of the most fertile land in the world. There's like 50 feet in some places of topsoil. and Right here, you have a desert, basically. And coincidentally, Danielle, I don't know if you're still here, but the um, dancing video guy, that was at the gorge. I could tell in the background, that's right there. <laughs> <laughs> that was the Columbia River right behind there. Um, and then you have the foothills of the Rockies getting here, and it's mostly forested land. And traditionally, Spokane, there's a river that you can't really see the Spokane River. And the Spokane River was a place where um, Native people c came together because there's a huge waterfall and there's tons of fish. And so it was a great place to eat. And it was ex is extremely lush. And so you had Nez Perce all the way coming up from the south and then the tribes coming down all the way from Canada. And so Spokane has always been a place where people gather. This is what we have learned from our tribal histories that are um, in Spokane, and so we're very grateful to the Spokane tribe for keeping track of that. <laughs> and this whole biomimicry thing is really a lot of what our tribal um, and indigenous um, people in Spokane are talking about and all over the world. So this is like, we're just sort of catching up to this. But our place is a place-based modeled. This is, these are our, this is our campus. Um, we started with this building and then we just sort of started growing because the community was like, we need more, we need more, we need more of this. It's, we didn't have a place to gather. So um, we, with the whole biomimicry, biomimicry is a nature inspired lens for design purposes and it can be social design and it can be physical design. So physical design is like, you know, they're taking a look at orange peels and using that structure to figure out food. How do we preserve food? 
And on the social side, you know, the, it's helping us to deconstruct the choices that we make traditionally in a capitalist and in our economy, in our models. You know, efficiency is the way that we make decisions, right? But in nature, sometimes there are decisions that are made because it actually helps with resilience. And efficiency may not actually help with that. So, you know, having those intentional choices, having those intentional, that this model has helped us decide how we're going to make those decisions. So this is, these are our buildings. This is the overview. We are kind of learning, this is Main Street. And we're kind of learning that, um, you know, the measures that we're looking at to figure out if we're successful are sometimes different than whether or not we're profitable, <laughs> which we're never profitable. Um, it's, but you can see here, there is, this is actually used to be a four lane road. And now it's a, um, we cut it down to two lanes and there's um, parking in the middle and it's this big pilot project and everybody's freaking out because it's like angled parking. And, um, but it was, our area was so successful that we needed more parking. And so that's one measure, you know, you look at it and you go, oh, we're, we have parking issues. Everybody complains about it. We also are, the city's really happy with us because we have the most tickets per <laughs> block. So everybody's happy. Um, here is our co-op. This is a food co-op. And you can see the, we have solar panels on all of our buildings. Um, but the food co-op was an, a situation where, you know, we are trying to serve the whole person. And that includes healthy foods and, that and integrating food systems. So that's, um, that was our effort to do that. And you know, we had some major, major setbacks with that because Spokane may or may not have been ready for that, but um, we forced them eventually. This is um, some of the spaces. These are some of the spaces that we have. Um, one of the things that we took from um, our biomimicry work is, you know, Beauty is important, and life-sustaining places are important. And what does that mean for people? It means light, and it means being able to um, walk into places and not feel like you're closed in necessarily, but also making sure that people can have the privacy that they need to work. So that's a move, moving target. We also have a children's center. Um, all of our people, um, like my children, are in the Children's Center, and that's also serving the whole people, the whole person, right? Families are a part of this. Um, our Children's Center is one of the most, um, like, well, like lauded children's centers in the state because um, we're subsidizing it with our rents, and they are able to provide just the most amazing services to our kids and teach out to other teachers in our region. There they are again, because they're so cute. Um, we have an art space co-op. This is independent radio, independent movie theater. Again, it's the arts, it's food, it's everything. Fair trade store. And again, here's all the light that you can see. And that's all intentional in the design to make sure that it's a life-sustaining design. Plants can grow in almost every corner in our building because there's natural light. Here's our newest project, and it was a, um, how do you call it, what do you call it? The commons. The, the commons, it's the commons. This is the commons. This is a coffee shop, but there's also a brewery, bakery, um, and a couple of shops. But we also opened it up to, um, and we, were, we were having an issue with our Native American um, group. It's called, um, well, I, won't, I guess I won't say who it is, but they weren't, in, they weren't really engaging to your question earlier. And um, one, of the, one of the folks that worked down there, they were like, we want to start a Native American gallery. And we were like, we want your Native American gallery with um, arts and, um, so, and, and goods. And so they, got, they, they put in their business into our, into our building. And then all of a sudden, we're having so much more synergy with them. So it took them kind of recognizing that they needed this, but also us going, yes, and we want to help you. And then we have our training spaces. And I don't really want to get into too much about that one because I feel like that's going to lead into what you're talking about. And here's another picture of our co-op. So Summer's going to 
tackle the hard question. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> we put this question together. How do you keep innovating in a finite space? Okay, I'm going to go here. Thank you. Um, in part... Clips Katie. In part because that's the question we all have to be asking and integrating into our work rather than applying a sustainability lens after we've already launched a project. How do we integrate it and start with that from the beginning? Um, so biomimicry, like Katie said, is the conscious emulation of nature's genius. Um, and so we're going to apply that to innovating um, in our buildings. So one of the challenges that we've come across recently, we've been physically expanding slowly for the last 20 years. Started with one building, acquired another, acquired a third, fourth, fifth. And now we're almost 20 years old and we're saying, okay, who are we? Who have we been? What's next for us? And having the biomimicry lens has really helped us put language to uh, the last 20 years, and is also helping us figure out how to talk about what we want um, coming next. So we're going to dive into biomimicry a little bit more deeply. Um, biomimicry is based on uh, life's principles, and all life's principles um, create conditions that are conducive to life. So you can see the six that most um, design projects implement at some stage, whether it's scoping, uh, development, launch, but we're going to focus on one specifically, which is being locally attuned and responsive. And I thought this would be a really great biomimetic principle to dive into with this group, uh, especially given the last presentation that we just had. Um, so some strategies that nature has um, in order to be locally attuned and responsive, include leveraging cyclical processes, using readily available materials and energy, using feedback loops, and cultivating cooperative relationships. And again, we're going to zoom in a little bit more just so we can have a taste of what we're talking about. One of the places where we've gotten to apply um, the feedback loops and the cooperative relationships is through um, a custom that we have in our space um, called mac and cheese. <laughs> so we don't do waffles. Oh, mac and cheese Monday. Mac and cheese Monday, sorry. Mac and cheese Monday, it's <laughs> not waffle Wednesdays, but same carbo loading, I guess. Um, and so the idea is that this is our opportunity to connect with our tenants on a monthly basis. It's a very informal feedback loop, but for a long time, it, it's, it's kind of what we had to go on. Um, and it's also our opportunity to help nurture the cooperative relationships. And so when we started this program six years ago or so, it looked like people getting up front of each other in a rather formal way and presenting about their work. And so for about two, it took us two years to cycle through all of our organizations, and they all presented about a specific project that was going on and sort of the history of their work. And then we thought, okay, we sort of know who's on campus, but do we know each other? And so the next iteration of Mac and Cheese two years later was bringing in a storytelling group out of San Francisco to help us learn how to tell our stories, but also leverage that for professional development and learn how to connect your personal story to the work that you do. And now we're kind of looking at the third iteration of this same program, of the same custom, and we're getting together and talking about racial equity. So we know who's in the buildings. We've gotten to know each other a little bit better through the storytelling, and now we are tackling some really hard issues that none of us are equipped to figure out alone. So as um, a shared space sort of like facilitator, I guess you could call us, um, we're trying to figure out how do we create the spaces for those conversations that you can't program necessarily into your, your daily work life, at least easily. So we're trying to create the space and opportunity for that. Um, another place where we are applying some biomimicry principles is in a new co-working space called Niche Coworking. Um, we started out by asking, okay, we have a, a, a whole floor that's now vacant within our building because an organization moved out and um, got their own building, which is great. They're very successful. Um, but they had all of these little tiny office spaces that were built out on the single floor. And so we were looking at a total, like knocking those teeny tiny offices uh, over and doing a completely new build out, or can we do something with this really strange space? And so we started reaching out to all the other co-working spaces around Spokane, and we said, you know, is there a need for another co-working space? And they said, not really traditional co-working, but 
there is a need for people who want to lock a door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have 22 offices that became available as of last Friday. Um, and so there is also kind of a hot desking type um, situation that's available for people as they maybe grow a little bit and add a team member, they can sort of flex. We can also, we're across the street from the convention center, so we can also um, host folks who are coming into town for business engagements. And then it's also, um, a, it, it fits into our ecosystem in how uh, a lot of our tenants have uh, grant funded projects or uh, the, the tribes have a lot of seasonal workers. So we're able to create a space for those uh, temporary staff to land. And a lot of those staff were kind of bunking up with other um, staff members within that organization. And that can be great for the short term, but if you're talking six, nine month, year long project, um, that can become challenging for certain people. So we're trying to be inclusive, but also give people their own spaces. And I, I just wanted to um, kind of throw this out there now. Um, I, I think that this idea of being locally attuned, we've used our mac and cheese um, uh, Mondays to be locally attuned, but I would be really interested in hearing from this group about strategies that you've used to be locally attuned, um, what has been successful for you, and what challenges do you see moving forward in, in being locally attuned? And we're open to questions too, but I just wanted to... That's something that we're thinking about all the time. How do we create these feedback loops? Um, how do we leverage existing traditions and habits that people already have um, to, con to continue introducing new vitality and resilience into our system? That's an excellent point. Are there, are there thoughts or answers to that question? Liz. I'm sorry, I'm kind of losing my voice. <clears throat> uh, I mean, one thing that we do is we hire people from the communities that we work in and that are embedded in those communities. Just simply, and we could go into more detail, but um, we try to have our staff and board um, represent the people that we're working with. Yeah, you know, like, oh, you have one. I, 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 do, I did feel like I needed to take that. Um, I do feel like, um, you know, it's in terms of our sustainability, this, this, we're in the sustainability section, which I, you know, it's like people hear biomimicry and it's like, it must be that. But really it is, it, it's all about this value shift that we, to be truly sustainable, we do need to think about our world and how we are naturally attuned to it. And, and so the local business, like how we, how we develop resiliency in our system. So we have our building, one of our buildings is LEED Platinum Certified. Um, and it's very, very much like responsive to what is in Spokane. So we like have holding tanks for water because basically we're on a big pile of basalt and if it rains, it just goes straight into the river, whatever's in the water. So we capture water in our, in our basement. So, and, and hold it in these like six, like 10,000 gallon tanks or whatever. And then we slowly let that back in so it can go through the, um, the sewage treatment plant. Well, these are things that like, our local businesses and, and contractors know how to do now because they did it for us. And so that, that intelligence is, is being shared that way because we're, we, do, we also um, very much hire, as to the extent possible, local contractors. When we first started in 2001, nobody knew how to do green building. I mean, they were, and mostly it was the resources, right? It's like, well, how do we get... Um, whatever, How, there was no low VOCU paint in Spokane. Like that's a long time ago. There's no um, insulation that was not totally toxic. And what we learned is that they, they just didn't know where to get it. Now they do. I mean, and it, you know, it's not, it's not just us, it's other, it's technologies growing, but it's like it, to be innovative, you kind of have to ask people to be like, we're gonna help you learn mm -hmm. and we're gonna pay you to learn too. Um, I, I'm interested in knowing um, if you don't mind sharing the feedback that you all received during those feedback loops and then how you incorporated that feedback into future programming or future development. I did a series of roundtables last summer where we just invited people to informal lunches of up to seven to eight and asked them how long they've been connected to the buildings, do they feel a sense of belonging, what have we done well and what could we do better for them? 
And we also invited folks who may have been involved 15 years ago, who've kind of launched out into other organizations, and tried to get a sense of how getting their start within our buildings may have helped them in some way moving forward. And a lot of the feedback was around, well, this, this, it, it is like this is just kind of an office space, and it's a space to ask what's possible. Um, and we were really, really proud of, of that response from people, that we had created a space in which organizations could resource, uh, share resources and network, but also ask, you know, what more can we be doing together? That's, I think, our greatest achievement to date. And the, to your point about the feedback loops, I mean, what we heard is that we need more feedback loops. That too. Um, <laughs> and that, you know, I mean, and, and sitting here today, you know, the technology that we started with, like we, like for example, we've always been trying to get a security system in place, and it became even more important this spring. We got hit up with some Nazi hate stuff, which is too bad, and obviously really like pushed us to be like, okay, we need to re-examine this security issue. Well, ten years ago, nobody was carrying around text messages, right? Like in their pocket. Well, now it's a texting system. It's like that. So, you know, it's like these feedback loops that we felt so complicated. Some of it's like you just kind of have to sit with it and, um, and be with it and, until something emerges. And that's, that's another thing that I think, you know, because we've been here for so long, we can kind of go like there's kind of, you kind of take a longer arc. And that's why we start with like, what is our ecosystem that we're in? Spokane has always been an innovative place in our region. And it always will be. And so, you know, taking this longer arc, what are we trying to achieve here? Um, it doesn't all have to happen like today or tomorrow. Um, and and that that helps me because I'm. It grounds me in like the work long term. I I also want to add something challenging regarding feedback loops. We've also taken a hard look at our staff members, mm -hmm. too, and that those can lead to some hard conversations. But where are people accidentally being uh, gate closed fisted gatekeepers in a sense? And where are how can we improve the flow just among our staff? And how can that then generate impact around the entire system? And those aren't easy conversations to have, but they're, they're really important. Who's doing what? And is that the best fit for their skills and their talents? And, you know, we're not a top-down organization, so biomimicry has been really helpful in terms of self-organizing and learning how to talk about our different roles. There's a lot of um, research out there in hive studies and, 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 and um, social insect theory. Uh, these are two really great resources to check out. Biomimicry 3.8, I did a biomimicry leadership intensive with them in Montana earlier this year. Uh, right up there near the Continental Divide and um, learned a lot about applying biomimicry for social innovation. And that, uh, that particular leadership intensive was co-led by the biomimicry for uh, social innovation. So they have lenses and toolkits and kind of primers to help uh, understand how to talk about ecosystem. You know, we hear the buzzword ecosystems. We were talking about this over lunch. You know, this is going to be good for ecosystem. Well, what does that mean? This kind of gives us a common language to talk about that. Okay, no questions. I gotta move quicker today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how are you guys organized? Like, is there an overall board for all the, the buildings and then, you know, separate ones? Or yeah, how does it all work? Well, that's a long answer. <laughs> we are kind of, we're comprised of a bunch of organizations. And um, it's, it's a, there's a food co-op, there's, and that's run by the members, of which I am one, and so is Summer. Um, and then there's the foundation, which I run, and that's board. And then there's an LLC, and that's, an, uh, that's owned by the um, primary funder. Um, and then the, there's individuals. I mean, and so, you know, it's, what we have found is that, like, by having lots of different legal structures that we can organize from, we can do whatever we want. You know, as, as, and you know, our tax, our CPA is always like, what are you guys doing now? You know, like, <laughs> like you did what? You know, and he's like, we're gonna have to move that over to the foundation, that's not gonna work, you know? And if anybody's there on the IRS, please don't look into that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, you know, you, but, but that is being supple, you know, and, and so I, that's my short, long answer. 
two kind of process questions. Um, what do those dialogues on racial equity look like and how are you facilitating them? And then to the question about kind of staff and looking at staff roles, how did you gather information and, and have those conversations? Do you want to do racial equity? Sure. So um, we long a while ago. There's a there's an organization that kind of was became a our the policy. It was a, one of these situations where all of our organizations were like, we don't all get to work on one issue together, and we need to organize. We need to be have an organized organization of four organizations. And so they brought um, they do a ton of work, but racial equity has been one of their main things because race is something that divides us and that is against their mission, right? Our mission altogether. So we, um, and I'm on that board, so we brought a racial equity trainer, trainer from, um, do you know Glenn Harris? He's, a, he's at the Center for Social Inclusion. And now he's at Color Lines, which is anyway. So he came and he did a training, and then we did it, and he did a train the trainer. So we're building a racial equity trainer cohort. So we're supporting that group to come and do the trainings in our buildings. And we're trying to create a shared language so that we can sit down. And then our commitment as an institution is to host these lunches and apply a racial equity lens that we all have gone through the training on now and apply that lens um, in our conversations. And then whatever, so whatever comes up in our conversations, that will always be a lens that we're gonna be raising. So it could be housing, which is gonna be a big issue here in Spokane, like right now. There's also issues with the coal trains coming through that nobody's happy about. Um, so you know, in all of that work, we're going to be having this racial equity lens. And so, and but you know, one of the things that um, we have been struggling with in Spokane is that we don't have very, we're not very good at talking about this stuff. So, what does it look like to be in a community where we know each other, we know what we do, we have shared values? Let's practice talking about this issue so that when we can, so that we can be supporting each other, but also learning how to, what works and what doesn't work in our conversations about it. And the next phase of that is, we, so we just finished our racial equity trainings last week. Uh, the next phase of that in our uh, Mac and Cheese Mondays is we ask people to just write down questions that, or concerns that they had around racial equity so that we're going to uh, divide into small groups and have conversations in January after people have had kind of time to digest the training. Um, and then there's going to be an option for organizations to work with some of the trainers in operationalizing racial equity in their organizations. So we're curious to see how that goes, but that's something that we're, we're gonna be offering next year. Um, and regarding staffing, we are in the middle of trying to figure it out. We are working actually with a facilitator named Toby Hirschwitz. Hirschwitz? Hirschwitz. Hirschwitz. Um, she's out of the biomimicry for social innovation. Um, and just consulting with her about how do we handle staff issues in a loving, supportive way that also supports like the system and our mission and what we're trying to do. So we don't know yet. Right, because it's like a cycle, right? And that the one thing that we always are talking about is like we're going to come up with solutions. And it's solutions are just a moment in time, right? If, if, if we start thinking about this as a life cycle, instead of a start to finish thing, you can go from thinking about this, oh, our, our solution is over now and we have to find something new, to being like, oh, we're in a process of letting that go and transforming it and letting it go to ground and then c coming back up as something new. And that's what we learned in Mac and Cheese is that it was a cycle that it was kind of at its, it was nobody was coming, everybody was sort of like, or it was the same people. And so it's um, finding ways to revive these old programs. And so same thing goes for staffing, right? Is that somebody, you know, has outlived their, like that their, their, their skills are no longer being well used in their current situation. How do we help them grow into a better situation instead of just being like axing, which is what we normally do. I love how this all ties together back to Kathy and Allison's presentation of the dog that doesn't change for 50 years. <laughs> um, and we need to. Uh, we have a question online. How much do you rely on incentives to encourage ongoing engagement by partners? You know, what, what we've found that works best to engage our members is walking 
to everybody's office and being like, what's up? You going to the thing today? You're not? Oh, here's the thing. You know, you should come. And like, oh, okay. Um, and so the incentive, no. I mean, we, we, have, um, we have a good track record. We have a good reputation. This racial equity training is um, well respected in our community. Same thing goes for um, the Million Person Project, the storytelling one that we were working on. Um, people really enjoyed it. So, so there's trust, I think, um, and building that trust and making sure that you're following through with what you say you're going to do. Um, and then they keep coming back. Um, food. And food. And beer. <laughs> and beer. We have a brewery now. <laughs> so... Um, could you talk more about the storytelling training and um, kind of what you saw come out of that? What was like the methodology um, and how that might be maybe like a living resource? Because mm -hmm. it seems to me like something that could be universally helpful for different centers. We totally hit the nail on that one. I mean, and it was the trainers are great, but basically it was the perfect, it was the perfect training for personal development professional development, and then creating a shared language and a shared structure. And part of what the deal was is you can come to this training for free, but you have to sign up for Macaroni and Cheese Monday and talk at it. So that, that gave us like two years, two and a half years of people to do the presentation. And what it really was was, you know, telling your story and why you do what you do. And so, you know, somebody asked, like, I'm interested in, they asked, Paul, I think, I'm interested on in how you got here, you know, because you're a passionate guy and like you so clearly believe in what you do. Well, why does he do that? And that's actually way more interesting than whatever, not, not in this case, of course, but like, but, but it's really an interesting way to get to, because you're building that relationship and you're finding out what they're doing too. So um, your question was, that how did that evolve? And so that was kind of how we we ended up in that training. It's called the Million Person Project. They're out of San Francisco, and their approach is story of self, story of us, and story of now. Mm -hmm. And you know, it happened. It just happened that she was like the niece of somebody that we knew, and you know, these kinds of things that happen. And you, we just sort of trusted that, and it was it was a good fit for us. We tried to get the moth, and that was like thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> Other questions for Katie and Summer? So it sounds like you're using biomimicry through a lot of a lot of your design processes, right? So how do you design staff process and decision making process? But thinking more about the the physical real estate, um, particularly interested about you know as how we create these spaces. Nonprofits, of course, are so used to like getting the space that they get, right? Right and um, I think, is it, I assume everybody here, and if you haven't, reads Nonprofit AF. Um, Katie and I were just talking about this, his couple posts ago, your, your broken chair is not a badge of honor, right? And so how do we get spaces that work? And so how have you seen biomimicry design approach helping you create physical spaces that work better for your tenants and your community? Do you want to try? I can try. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's what we tried to do with the co-working space. It was a weird existing space. Um, and so going out to the community and asking, you know, we kind of have this idea. Do you think it'll work? Do we need it? Um, so that was kind of implementing a feedback loop before even taking the first big step, which is, you know, deciding what this thing is going to be. As we were deciding, we engaged so I, I, you know, I think that's a big part of biomimicry. Um, are you asking also in terms of like physical design, mm -hmm. like the built environment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just how is it? How does it impact design decisions, right? So like, what, like, are there key learnings from biomimicry that impact design? How does it impact design decisions, and are there key? Anything you learn, like anything you're like, oh, this is great, and the biomimicry informed that choice. The interesting thing about that question is we are going back in time and understanding how we were accidentally using biomimicry along the way in some ways and how we were, in areas that we were struggling, this gives us the vocabulary to kind of talk about it. 
Um, so the, our LEED Platinum building the, um, was a historic rebuild. So that was a crazy design challenge. How do we stuff all of this new technology into this weird existing building from 1908? Eight. Eight, 1908. Um, so we, we went, the, the nice thing about LEED is you have lots of people to consult with. <laughs> It's kind of like part of it. They they help you find your experts. Um, so I would I would say that's one thing. What else can you add, Katie? Well, just in this co-working space, like part of the reason why it was so weird is that there was a there was a wall that it's like so it really it, the it, the building is shaped like this. There's something down the middle. There's all these weird offices along the side, and then there was a wall right in the middle of it, and everybody was always lost. Like where am I, like, because you had to walk through and then you have to walk past this like fishbowl thing. It just, it was terrible. And then they, and then we were like, let's knock out that wall. <laughs> and it's like the traffic, it's like the traffic all of a sudden, like nobody gets lost. Everybody understands where they are. Like it's not, it's this, and it's so simple, right? But it has changed the way that that whole floor feels. And people are really grateful for that because, you know, we had the old tenants come through and they were like, why did we do that? You know, and it turned out like 10 years ago, or, you know, whenever, 15 years ago when they moved in, somebody wanted a closet space, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, it, it's, it, it, it messed up the flow. And that's not how we flow. That's not how water flows. That's not, you know, it's, it's, um, so anyway, that barrier was something. Um, I think the other thing that's interesting, it's like we, um, this ended up just being something that we did because it was cheaper, but um, we had to put in a stairwell and an and a elevator. We could not do that without spending so much more than we were willing to spend. So we actually built a tower on the outside, and, um, and that's where the elevator is and the staircase. And the staircase actually has really nice windows. And so what we learned actually also, the Bullet, the Bullet Foundation did this in their building, which is LEED Platinum cert certified now and way more fancy. You build a beautiful stairwell and people will use it because they, they don't feel trapped in there. And we have plants in there. It's really nice now. And so you're, you're getting exercise. It's good for you. It's, um, you don't have to, like, I know it sounds weird, but like, it's, it's energy to use those elevators. And um, you end up seeing people, right? in passing, and so you have those synergies, and so everybody's always talking in the stairwell. It's nice there, um, and, like, and so I think that that was an accidental design thing that we did because it was cheaper, but it's actually turned out to be really, really important to like, the way that our, the, the traffic flows in that building. But yeah, if we had done it intentionally, then we'd be like amazing, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, join me in giving Summer and Katie a round of applause. Thank you.